So let's resume with a little conversation about the lure of the single causation. So in the previous three segments, I've been trying to make the argument about how powerful uh, factorial designs really are and how pretty much everything in the environment has multiple causations, um, especially psychological factors, you know, behaviors, things like that. There are multiple factors that contribute to an outcome. So if that's true, why is it the case that we hear sort of simplistic conversations about complex things? Um, I'm going to throw a couple of them out just as examples and um, try not to think I'm hitting any, anything on purpose. Um, but for example, when we talk about um, mass shootings, a lot of times people will come up with a single solution to mass shootings. And we all have to be aware that there are multiple factors that contribute to that outcome. Um, when we talk about um, high school dropout rates, a lot of times people will, will throw out their solution to high school dropouts. That is a multifactorial outcome. There are a lot of things that contribute to, you know, a person dropping out of high school. Um, just some simple, you know, simple examples of things that are hot button issues that people think if only the world enacted my solution, everything would be perfect, right? Well, that's, that's the lure of the single causation. There is rarely a single cause for an outcome. Now, I'm assuming we're all psych majors. I get uh, occasionally the, the rogue non-psych major taking this class, so um, please don't be offended if I just lump you in with all the other psychology students. Um, but one of the things that I've found as a psychologist and psychology person is that people will ask me, well, and this is the way they'll phrase it too. They'll say to me, well, which is it, nature or nurture? And I'm like, about what? What are we even talking about? I mean, because nature and nurture impact so many different things that it's like, what are we, what are you even asking me about? let alone, I guess I don't even need to know what you're asking about because the correct answer is both. Um, but when people ask that question, a lot of times they're disappointed if you say both, you know, that they both play a role. I was just giving a lecture in my lifespan development class about intelligence. And when we say that intelligence is about 80% genes, that's, that means 20% of it is attributable to something else right? Environment, experience, nurturing, something else, right? So even if you think it's largely nature or you think it's largely nurture, there's probably some part of it that's at least the other component, right? Um, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd share, since that's a common question, I know I get it a lot. The other one I always get a lot is, are you analyzing me? And it's like, well, I wasn't until you asked me that. Um, but <laughs> uh, nature or nurture, I thought I'd give you an example of, of um, how the genes and the environment interact with each other as just an argument for, um, you know, it's probably multifactorial, right? So in developmental psychology, we talk about something called a passive genetic influence. The idea here is that the, the child has inherited a genetic trait that the parents happen to share. In this case, and by the way, I found these pictures off the internet. I don't know who these people are. I'm just making, I just kind of like Google imaged for, you know, people all doing the same behavior. So this is how I ended up with the pictures. So I apologize if you happen to recognize yourself in any of my pictures. <laughs> I just get them off the internet. Um, so here we have an example of, let's say, a mom who plays the piano and is very musical. And so she has a baby and he comes out and he's interested in it. He wants to play with the piano. Also, he has intrinsic ability. And because his mom's interested in it, the equipment is there. Um, for him to just smoothly go from, you know, innate ability to actually, you know, nature, you know, the nature provided this in, innate ability and then the nurture supporting it. And so he doesn't actively have to do anything. He just has to be there in that circumstance with his, you know, pre-programmed abilities and the environment naturally will support it. Um, that's what we call a passive genetics influence. So he doesn't have to actively do anything to fulfill his potential because the environment will pick up the slack. All right, here's another person I found on the internet. Um, the story here is that she uh, saw this 
little keyboard at the neighbor's garage sale and was like so enamored of it that mom and dad brought it home and um, she keeps picking away and playing at it and, and it kind of sounds like she's picking out music it's like she actually has a little tuneful ability to it um, you know one could imagine that as she ages she's going to ask for piano lessons and maybe one day will really you know assert her um, interest in music and this is called a reactive genetic influence because I'm imagining that the reason why she needed a, a pretend one is because there's not a piano in the house because maybe mom and dad aren't necessarily musical and, um, and or maybe they play a different instrument than what she's expressing interest in or something like that. And so she has to get the environment to react to her genetic ability, right? So she's she's able to elicit from the environment the support that she needs to achieve her fullest potential. Um, so in this situation, um, the difference between these two is that the child has to be more active in getting the, the environment to support her um, intrinsic abilities, but the um, environment is open to it and is willing to provide those experiences and that, you know, those benefits, whatever. Here in this last one, my story is that this guy has wanted to play the piano his entire life and his parents didn't think it was important. They didn't want him to waste his time playing the piano. He should be doing something else. And so here he is as a, you know, older adult and he has found this nice lady to be his piano teacher and he's finally taking piano lessons. Uh, so I'm letting him be my example of an active genetic influence where he has this predisposition that was not only not shared by his environment, but was actively um, you know, discount it. The environment really didn't want him to be doing it, let alone didn't, you know, react and, and support him like as in the reactive genetic influence. So here we have a person who, um, he, if, if he's going to get to reach his fullest genetic potential as, as far as this topic, he's going to have to be active about it. He's going to have to search out his opportunities. I kind of thought of the piano as my Google search because one of my friends is a piano teacher and her parents were very not into her taking piano when she was a kid. So she had to pay for her own piano lesson. She had to ride two buses and walk like a mile to get to her piano teacher's house to take piano lessons. And uh, she had to buy her own piano and uh, she paid for it by teaching lessons herself. And I mean, just like complete active genetic influence. I, her drive to do it, um, was not only not supported by the environment, but they, they put some, I think they put some roadblocks, some obstacles in front of her and she still, her genes wore out, you know, like ultimately they bore out. Um, so, and interestingly, I think she's got perfect pitch too. So I think, which is a really rare thing. And so I think she was like somehow genetically designed this way, even though the very people who gave her her genes didn't have that interest and didn't support it. So I'm using this as an example so that hopefully someday when somebody asks you, so what is it, nature or nurture? You could say, well, you know what? It's a gene and environment and interaction. It really depends on whether the environment was supportive. <laughs> and like, you'll have this whole little long diatribe where you can explain why it's a combination. Um, and then also hopefully this really il illustrates for you that there's not a single reason why a person is taking piano lessons or a single reason why, you know, as I was sitting here, thinking of the, um, you know, supportive or non-supportive environment, there are multiple reasons why the environment might not have had a piano in the house naturally, um, or why they might try and dissuade their, their offspring from pursuing piano lessons, right? Um, I'm thinking of my, a family member who actually plays the guitar himself and his son had the same knack and he would play the guitar. So when the son grew up, he expressed interest in, you know, wanting to become a musician and his parent said, um, we can't make a living at that. Well, and he really kind of dissuaded his, his son from doing it. And it was like, why would you be squashing him when you have musical ability? Oh yes, because you know how hard it is. Like there's really a lot of reasons why a person, why the environment might be reacting the way that it is. There's a lot of reasons why the, the, um, you know, offspring might be reacting the way that they are there. It all, it's all complex. And that's the thing I want you guys to walk away with is that there is not a single causation for anything. It's both. It's always both or three things or 10 things or whatever. Right. I mean, if we're going to get rid of society's ills, we got to get rid of a lot of things because there are multi factors that contribute to societal ills. All right. Now, the benefits of um, multiple methods are illustrated by this little thing that I 
took a picture of out of Discover Magazine. And they're talking about, it's a really long article. I just took out this one little section. And um, what they're trying to figure out is whether, you know, what the function of this little, what the function of neurogenesis is. Why would an adult rat grow new neurons is basically the question. So they thought, well, let's falsify neurogenesis. Let's, let's, what happens if there isn't neurogenesis, right? That might help us to explain what the function of neurogenesis is. Let's deprive the rat of, or the mouse of neurogenesis and see what happens. So they did so in, in inventive ways. And this gets at the multiple methods, um, manipulating the genes of mice and rats so that it will prevent neurogenesis um, or exposing the rats to powerful x-rays so that their brain cells won't um, grow new brain cells. And then the last example, the last strategy was administering cell destroying drugs so that if neurogenesis occurred, it immediately got killed by the drugs action. Three different ways that they came up with for, um, you know, in interfering with neurogenesis and, uh, why would they do this? Well, if you do multiple methods, if you say, okay, if I say I'm going to manipulate the genes so that they don't have neurogenesis, a critic could say, well, maybe your manipulation of genes had more effect than just on neurogenesis. Maybe you affected other things and that's what we're really seeing the effect of in their behavior or whatever. If I expose them to powerful x-rays, you know that they can cause all sorts of tumor growth and other kinds of things. So a, a critic could say, maybe the x-rays did more than just kill the growing baby neurons. Um, if we administer cell destroying drugs, a critic could say, well, I mean, maybe those drugs are the reason for that behavior, not the lack of neurogenesis, right? So by having multiple methods, we could say, okay, whether it was done through genes or x-rays or drugs, we see this same effect of the lack of neurogenesis. Like this is, this is consistent across no matter how you prevent the neurogenesis. So multiple methods are a great way to get away from, um, you know, the argument that your independent variable is um, not the, the cause, but instead, you know, some other confound is the cause. So multiple methods. All right, so the conclusion. Adding more factors boosts our explanatory power. Um, it allows for us to see those interactions among variables. While it is tempting to try and find the cause of outcomes, it's usually gonna be some kind of ma a multifactorial cause at the root, right? And that's what we really need to su suss out is which factors contribute and how much. All right, so while it's tempting, it's probably multifactorial. It's no, there's not that one simple fix for anything. All right, that wraps up chapter nine. So I will see you guys back for chapter 10.